very much, Will. Okay, thank you, Will, and thanks to you for staying on the last talk of the last session. But I'm really excited about this. Um, applications of machine learning in healthcare. And I think this is a great space to work in, that with machine learning, we could change the shape of human health. So a lot of people have been asking where I'm from, so I thought I should say I'm from Trinidad, and today it's a tiny island off the coast of Venezuela. It looks really big here, but if you look at the global map, it's just a dot of 1.25 million people. So that's where I'm from. Um, so my research in the healthcare domain, I mainly focus on latent variable modeling and looking at strategies of using latent variable modeling in a generalized framework for discovering subtypes of disease. So latent variable modeling, we have some observed manifestations of disease, and what we're trying to do is infer whether they're subtypes of disease. Mm, so latent variables are things that aren't directly measured, but we can infer them from things we measure. So the classical examples are in psychiatry. For example, things like depression that you can't necessarily measure with an instrument. You can ask questions and infer a latent variable so you get a scale of depression. Um, the other area I work on is longitudinal data analysis. So I look at a lot of measures of healthcare over time. Um, missing data, I'm not going to talk about missing data today. Right. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, all right, it's just me. Okay, so um, one of the problems I'm not going to touch on is that of missing data. But in healthcare, this is a really important problem to think of. What are the mechanisms of missing data? Whether we could assume that data is missing at random, whether data is not missing at random, what are the mechanisms of missingness? And generally, I look at this within a framework of latent variable modeling. But these are really important assumptions to think about and to look at in healthcare data. I um, also do some Bayesian data analysis, which is useful when you have some prior assumptions about health data. Causality, which I'll touch on. And also, I look at survival models. So, all apply to healthcare research. So, the general structure of the tutorial, first I'm going to set some ground rules, what to expect and what not to expect. Um, the main framework I'll be looking at is endotype discovery, as a motivation of a lot of the examples here. Um, and I'm going to talk about why that's important, what endotype discovery is, and why it's important. And I'll focus on examples. So I think that's the best way to, to learn about applications of machine learning, examples from my own work and examples in the literature as well. Um, inspired by Nando's talk yesterday, or day before yesterday, I'll talk about basic principles of causality, because this is important if we want to understand the causal mechanisms of healthcare data. And then tips for team science, because machine learning applications in healthcare or any other space is based on team science and learning to communicate on both ends. So the first ground rule is the elements of the project cycle. So this was explained really well by Neling and Will in the first talk. Um, so I'm going to take this for granted that all of this has been done in each of the examples I specify. So the first thing, when we have a project, we are trying to understand the problem. What is it we're trying to, to achieve? And what is it we're trying to model? Then we have our data set. We have to understand the data set, look at visualizations of that data. What are the distributions of that data? Then we prepare the data, whether it's normalization or batch normalization. We heard about that in the earlier talks. Then we evaluate the algorithms, whether through cross-validation. So I think it was the day before yesterday, there was a talk about, there was a mention on splitting your data into, you have the training set, the test set, and the validation set. And we use that to evaluate the algorithms. 
and we compare model evidence or log likelihood penalized in some way to evaluate the final model. And um, as a warning, I'm going to focus very little on deep learning. And I think um, it's important to say why. So deep learning has had many successes in the medical domain. I think a lot of these have been covered already. So we had the talk on reinforcement learning today, um, looking, at, looking at optimizing strategies for treatments of HIV. Someone gave that example. Um, and also we've had a lot of examples on image data sets where deep learning is very successful for for this sort of problem. Um, and someone presented a poster on breast cancer as well and using deep learning to uh, infer classification of tumors as well. Um, but one of the problems with deep learning is it's very data hungry and health, collect health data collection is very expensive. So if you want to collect a really good quality data set in healthcare, it's, it's very expensive generally. So I'm going to focus more on model-based approaches for this reason and focus more on hypothesis generating ra rather than hypothesis testing or deep learning. Um, another problem in the health space with deep learning is that it's difficult to represent uncertainty. And we have to say things and make assumptions in health data with levels of uncertainty. And the other problem as well, which I think is something that's an active area of research, is interpretability of these models as well, and translating them into, into something that's clinically relevant. But this has a lot of potential in creating technologies, deep learning. Um, so this is the general scenario when we have, when we're looking at treatment of disease. So in a randomized control trial, we have a patient group, um, someone who, a group of people who has a disease, whether it's cancer or HIV, or whatever disease. And generally, we have some random allocation. So usually that um, the sample size is based on some power calculation. So we want to get enough numbers in order to see whether there's a difference between the intervention and the group and the control group. So we give one group an intervention, a medication, and another group we may give a control, which would usually be what's the state of the art medication. And at the end, we measure the treatment effect. So um, maybe in the intervention, we see that a high proportion of patients are cured, but in the, in the control, we see that less patients are cured. So this is the general framework for evaluating treatment effects in a randomized control trial setting. But in reality, what we notice, and I think in this plot, what we want to know about are those patients who don't respond to treatment. Why is it that some people respond and some people and what we observe is actually that response is heterogeneous. So the patient group isn't a uniform group. That group has different characteristics. We see that some people respond to drugs and the drugs have no side effects. For some people, the drug is toxic and not beneficial. So we definitely don't want to give the drug to those people. Or um, for those group of people in gray, the drug is not toxic and it's not beneficial. So it's a waste of time giving them a drug. And this is really what motivates us, trying to identify that heterogeneity in the patient group. Another reason for understanding heterogeneity in disease is because of the low yield of replication in genetic studies. <clears throat> so this example is taken from asthma, which is the disease area I predominantly work in. And we see that there's a 50-50 chance of replication of genetic hits. So each of these represents one of the chromosomes, and those stars are SNPs that have been found to be significantly associated with asthma. And we see that there's really poor replication. And one of the questions is, why is there such poor replication if um, we believe that they're, co they're genetic causes for these diseases? So this is the motivation for endotype discovery. So with endotype discovery, what we're trying to do is identify those subgroups of disease based on the natural history of disease or based on what we observe, those symptoms we observe. So with endotype discovery, we're trying to identify those subgroups of complex diseases in order to get better or more targeted treatment and management strategies. And the idea is that those different subtypes or this, those different subgroups have some underlying mechanism which is distinctive or causal for those different subtypes. 
And if we understand the underlying mechanism, then we understand the cause of the disease and we can get better cures. So this is the basis for stratified medi medicine um, to get better targeted interventions. And um, this is something that's quite, yeah. Yeah, so, okay. So endotype, we're looking at, so based on this, picture, this slide here, what we see is that they're heterogeneous responses to disease. And we want to understand whether it's, we want to disaggregate that heterogeneity with endotype. So in a patient group, we realize they're heterogeneous responses. And one of the reasons there may be heterogeneous responses is because they're actually different subtypes of disease. Um, so in the type discovery, there may be an underlying mechanism or there may not be an underlying mechanism. So for example, some of these patients may have a genetic factor which makes them not respond to the drug or um, some other environmental factor which makes the drug toxic. And what we want to do with endotype discovery is identify those subtypes of disease based on machine learning methods. Is that? Yeah, and stop me if you have questions. That's great. And endotype discovery is something very natural to, to human beings because we're always looking for patterns, identifying patterns. Um, why do some people respond to treatments and some people? In the generalized framework, we use endotype discovery, at least in the examples I present, would be latent variable modeling. So with latent variable modeling, we have some phenotypes or things that we observe and or are different features. And we want to infer some sort of latent variable or parsimonious um, description of, of those observed features. Mm. And that latent variable could be something discrete. So it could be different, different types of those different features can have different weights of importance for inferring that. End. And um, this is generally the framework we use. So we can look at this latent variable modeling as a way of dimensionality reduction, where we have some observed features, for example, on a healthcare record. We have lots of symptoms that we see, and we want to see whether these symptoms can elucidate some sort of structure or some sort of categorization. And the tool we use for identifying those, that latent structure is probabilistic programming or probabilistic reasoning. So you had a whole tutorial on probabilistic reasoning. So usually we have some evidence and we want to make certain queries from that evidence. And the probabilistic model expresses our general knowledge of the situation, maybe a hypothesis. And um, we use some sort of inference algorithm to model and answer queries based on the evidence or the data and, and the questions we want to ask to get answers. So the answers would be probabilities on different outcomes. And someone told me this is the slide where you switch off. But I think this is really important. So um, the asthma, so I've, I'm going to show a couple of examples in the asthma domain. And um, this, was a, this was a graphical model. Well, I'll call it more a domain knowledge model that we put together. Um, six years ago when I started working on this project, trying to map out all of the data we had on asthma to see what is the structure within that. Can we look at different elements or different aspects of asthma? Because it's a complex disease. So you have aspects of asthma, allergy, genetics, environmental exposures. So we wanted to see whether we could infer some sort of structure in that. So the blue parts of that graph are things that we don't directly observe, but we want to infer from the data, and the orange parts are things that we do observe, and we want to use those latent. So, in the first example, um, it's based on a study we did a couple of years ago. So, when a child goes into the clinic, it's really hard to diagnose asthma. So, you don't usually diagnose asthma until someone is about eight years old. And um, it's, very hard, it's a very hard problem how to diagnose asthma or say someone has asthma. Uh, but usually you do this based on symptoms. So a child would come into the clinic with allergy, maybe poor lung function, so very poor breathing, wheezing, asthma medication, exacerbations, which means that they have to be hospitalized. And um, 
maybe Marcus Vasma. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Is that better? Okay. Um, I'll try to shout a bit more. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you have these phenotypes or observable manifestations of disease based on, based on what you see, what you observe. And very often, if a child comes to the clinic with these symptoms, they'd be classified as asthmatics. But what we see is that actually within this umbrella term of asthma, you see some people grow out of asthma, some respond to treatment, some don't respond to treatment. There are different levels of severity, and some people develop asthma later on in life. So what we say is that these could be different subtypes. The manifestation of how people respond to treatment or severity can be subtypes. So this may actually be different diseases with different underlying causes that we just call under that umbrella term of asthma. So in this particular study, oh, that's much better. Thanks. <laughs> now I can hear myself. In this particular study, um, we tried to define asthma subgroups or endotypes in a population-based birth cohort of 1,200 children. And we take measures from parental questionnaires. We ask them at age one, three, five, and eight, has your child wheezed? And we also have their, their primary care records, so the records, their health records as well, to see consultations for wheeze. And based on the pattern, the profiles we see over time, we're trying to identify distinct genetic and physiological markers which may be associated with these different subtypes. So the strategy we use for understanding those subtypes, we have the observed data. So we observe the GP record observations of wheeze. At, um, so we have the actual age and days when a child would have come to the clinic with wheeze. And we also have the parental observations as well. And we assumed that um, the GP records are a perfect manifestation of wheeze. So the doctor's always right. But also, maybe the parent doesn't always take their child to the doctor, or the parent doesn't know how to identify wheeze. So we've um, waited for that as well. And we infer some latent variable, which is true current wheeze, based on these two And we take those measurements over time. And we assume that this, is, this um, transition of current wheeze over time is governed by some latent class, or wheeze subtype K. So when we ran this, we identified five distinct latent classes, or we could call them endotypes of asthma. And we found that these each have distinct genetic and environmental characteristics. So we found that most people had no, no wheeze. Mm, there are some children who had wheeze in early life and then grew out of it by age five. And there were two groups with persistent wheeze. So this is 3% of children in the population. And we have another group with 13%. And we called this orange group persistent troublesome wheeze because these children who have so that y-axis should be, this is received medication. So they received us. But we see that they have a habit of hospitalization. That means that they're not responding to treatment. And for this subtype as well, we found a distinct marker um, so these three, this is a Manhattan plot, and what it shows us is the genetic association with, with persistent wheeze, persistent troublesome wheeze, that 3%, compared to all of the other children in that study. And um, three of the genetic hits were significantly associated with other groups as well, but we found this mechanism called CDHR3, which we were able to prove in the lab mechanistically as well, that this is associated with that subgroup of children. And the people with this genotype, with the rare allele of this genotype, were also significantly had a higher risk of hospitalization as well. So I think this is a motivating example of endotype discovery, which has major implications for refining disease diagnosis. And using this, we could identify biomarkers. So we identified that genetic biomarker which helped us to understand the underlying disease mechanism. And this is the sort of approach that helps us in machine learning, that helps us to move towards more.
personalized treatments and management strategies. So I put this picture here of a drug called Nucala. So it's quite exciting. Um, in 2015, after I published this paper, I went to work at GSK. And in GSK, they developed this drug, which was created for precisely this subtype of children as well. And um, it got approval from the, from the Food and Drug Administration in the, the year that I was in GSK. So this sort of endotype discovery can also help with the drug development. It's a good way of trying to understand structure in the data and generating hypotheses about, about disease heterogeneity. Any questions? Yeah. No. Yeah, so um, I think that's the, yeah, so that's a good question. So they don't necessarily mean anything. It could just be a pattern of symptoms over time. But the important thing is that there is some sort of external validation of those latent variables. It's not so much the latent variables in themselves, but we want to see whether it's really an endotype and whether we could identify biomarkers based on that's how we That's how we make it. And then... When you discover an association, um, what we tend to do is try to take it to the end to see whether mechanistically and actually has some sort of meaning. So um, the next question I'm going to look at is causality and allergy. So this is something that has been taught in standard textbooks, um, where when a child has eczema in early life, so eczema is an itchy rash that comes and goes. And very often, children get eczema, like diaper rash. Um, and the sort, of, the sort of hypothesis is that you have eczema in early life, then you go on to develop asthma, then you develop rhinitis or hay fever. And this is how allergy is developed. And these symptoms are seen to be causally linked. Um, so in drug development, a lot of the strategies have been towards targeting children who have eczema in early life in order to prevent allergy later on in life. So, Looking at the data we have, so I've been working on five longitudinal birth cohorts. Hmm. Yeah, so the, the hypothesis is that it's a causal relationship. So you have eczema in early life, then you have asthma, then you have... So this is age and... Yeah. It's, it's very common to, to get eczema at some point. So, yeah. Yes, you can. You can, yeah. 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 So the hypothesis is that most asthma and hay fever is caused by eczema. So that's the... That's a standard textbook principle that, yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Um. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Okay, that's an interesting question. So, asthma is classified as an allergic disease. It's classified as an allergy, as an allergic disease. So eczema, which is this ishi rash, can be triggered by environmental factors. So it's like an allergy. Eczema is like an allergy. Asthma is like an allergic disease, I think. Um, <laughs> asthma is an allergic disease as well. So when someone um, has airway constriction, sometimes it's triggered, for example, by a cat. So if you're allergic to a cat, sometimes, yeah, you can, um, you can develop, you can have an asthma attack. And hay fever is from the environment. So these are all seen as allergic diseases. And that's the understanding of causality. I'm not a doctor, so. <laughs> anyway, so um, the objective of this, 
of this study was to capture disease heterogeneity and try to see whether this, uh, this um, mechanism that we observe actually exists on a population level and to see whether the majority of children who develop um, allergy later on in life show this, show this pattern. So we use a probabilistic modeling approach for this. The data was taken from two cohorts um, because they had very similar, similar data on eczema, wheeze, and hay fever. The wheeze was the marker we used for asthma because you can't detect it early in life. Um, you can't detect asthma early in life. So we took 2,000 children from the Manchester Asthma and Allergy Study, which is a longitudinal booth cohort. So children are born into the study, and we follow them up every three years. And they're, well, they were 11 at the time of the study. And the Bristol, the Avon Longitudinal um, Study, is another longitudinal booth cohort with 1,000 children. And when we look at the profile of eczema, wheeze, and rhinitis in these two studies, that it does follow something similar to an atopic march. If we just look at a population, if we just look at the population cross-sectionally, so we see a high probability of eczema at age one, then followed by wheeze, and followed by hay fever later on in life. So it looks like an allergic march of symptoms, like what we saw in the previous slide. Um, so we used three models to try to compare evidence about the structure of this data. So we asked questions on the state of eczema at each time point. Um, and we assumed that this follows a, a hidden Markov model chain, and that eczema, wheeze, and rhinitis, hay fever, are three separate diseases. And um, your probability of eczema at age one is at, age, at a given time point is is conditioned by what happens at the previous time point. And we assume Dirichlet priors, so that each, um, each uh, there's some, some number of classes, distinct classes, and that this is, this is um, conditioned by some latent class. We don't know the number of the latent classes a priori. In a second model, we assumed that we explicitly assumed the allergic transition of symptoms that's generally hypothesized. So if you have eczema at age, wheeze at age five, let's say, that's conditioned by your eczema state at the previous time. And that also conditions your, whether you have hay fever at the subsequent time point. But also um, it's conditioned by what happens at the previous time point symptom or disease. And this again is governed by some latent class or disease Find each child to their class with the highest posterior probability. And the third model, we just assumed that at each age you have some disease state which is independent. Um, so you observe eczema, wheeze and rhinitis at each time point and that gives you some latent state which is independent to what happened at the previous time point. And this pattern for each child is governed by some latent disease profile. And actually, this model gave the best fit. Um, the inference engine we used was in So the, I guess the advantage of Interfo.net is that you write your own probabilistic program. compiler and you use a C-sharp compiler and you get your probability distribution. Ah, no. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay, great. All right. That's good. People want to listen to what I have to say. All right. Let's try. I think that's best, actually. Thanks. Um, so we also tested sensitivity to different priors, and we found consistently that eight different subgroups or subtypes of disease were the optimal, were the optimal number of classes. And we assigned children to each of these classes based on their posterior probability. And what we found is that only 3% of children followed a profile similar to the atopic march whereas most 
eczema, wheeze, and rhinitis occurs independently. So um, in this sort of way, we, tried, we were able to disaggregate symptom heterogeneity. And this is a good way of trying to disaggregate causality as well, because we can't make up, up, um, necessarily make assumptions of causality of things on a cross-sectional level when we don't look at individual change over time. So in this, yeah. Yeah so, yeah, so they were all assigned probabilistically, and then we just labeled them based on the actual observed data. Yeah, yeah, so that's true. So Manchester had a higher proportion, has a higher proportion of asthmatics, but we saw consistent patterns and consistent profiles across the two groups. So that's really interesting, that in two geographically independent locations, you find that. So we have replicated it across other cohorts as well, in Scotland and in Southampton, and you see the same pattern occurring. So yeah, that's, that's the thing. So um, what we saw is that only a small proportion of children follow a trajectory similar to that of the atopic march. So the allergic march, or this march of symptoms that um, people think causes allergy, reflects pa uh, patterns on a population level. So even though we see those patterns on a population level, it doesn't na necessarily reflect how symptoms could vary over time in an individual's life course. Um, the third problem I'm going to look at is antibiotic resistance, which has been in the news quite a lot recently as a global problem. So there's a problem of oversubscribing antibiotics. And I don't know if this is very clear. But um, so the, the x-axis shows number of courses of antibiotics. And the y-axis, we see the probability of IBS, inflama inflammatory bowel disease, in, among children. So as number of antibiotics goes up, we see that the probability of IBS goes up as well over time. So this is quite a worrying phenomenon, antibiotic resistance, not just for diseases like IBS, but for diseases we're trying to tackle with antibiotics as well. And um, so we looked at this within the respiratory disease symptom as well, because there's a hypo hygiene hypothesis that if you take antibiotics, it's going to increase the probability of you having, having asthma later on in life. So it can increase the, prob the chance of having a certain subtype of asthma. But there are other, there are other things that can affect um, what's known as your microbiome profile. So this is what happens in the gut. One, one aspect is antibiotics can affect what happens in the gut, and this in turn affects whether you have lung disease or not, or patterns of lung disease in it. So the data for microbiomes is something called an operational taxonomic unit, or an OTU. And this is highly zero-inflated data. So this is just to illustrate what this data is like. So we have different OTUs on the, on the y-axis the, in the columns. And in the rows, we have each time point when a child's OTU was measured. So some were at 24 months, some at six weeks. And for each of the OTUs, you can break down this measure into, into different um, classes. So you have a su super kingdom, a phylum, a class, order, family, and genus. So you can see what, what the different genuses, but we couldn't measure species. And when you look at patterns of microbiomes over time, you see that there's, there's very little variation. So this was just using dimensionality reduction using principal components analysis. There's very little variation in early life, and then it sort of expands later on in life. And we can actually use correlation network analysis to look at the evolution of microbiome profiles over time, because maybe this can elucidate as well um, different symptoms that children experience over time. Yeah. So the microbiome, the microbiome is a measure of what happens in the gut. So it's a measure of bacteria in the gut. Um, 
and the OTUs measure our measure of your, what, what's going on in your microbiome. So these, these different nodes are the OTUs. So there are 1,200 OTUs for um, different points you can measure for bacteria. And it's very noisy data. It's very heterogeneous. So one of the things we want to do is identify patterns in that and see how it changes over time and whether changes over time in that profile are informative of, of whether you develop respiratory disease or not so that we can understand the mechanisms. So we see in the first, in that top column and first row there, that um, there's, this is a structure we, in, we identified at six weeks and then at three months, these are what are in common with six weeks and three months between four months and six weeks. So we see changes in the profile, in what's common in the profile over time. And what we found actually is um, a lot of that data is pretty noisy. And we can actually identify, use just top, the top five, um, the top five gene, gene, genera uh, in fur structure in the microbiome. So the top five were these bacteria here. And um, we see that that's associated with profiles in acute respiratory disease and healthy samples as well. And those are significantly different. So this is just a high level example of how we can look at, at um, different data types, some microbiome data to understand um, significant associations in. Another, any questions? With that? Another, any questions? Another, um, problem in the healthcare domain is, is cancer. So the statistics are quite harrowing. 12.7 um, million people discover they have cancer each year, 7.6 million die, and 30 to 40 percent of these deaths can be prevented. But with cancer, we lack the tools for early detection and diagnosis. And um, cancer cells, even within the same tumor, are heterogeneous. So this is one of, the, one of the ways that endotype discovery can help us as well, to try to disaggregate that heterogeneity in, in cancer cells um, and see whether there are differences between, between the So this study by, um, by Fakur, uh, it was an ICL workshop paper in 2013, they did use deep learning to enhance um, cancer diagnosis. And the aim was to determine the difference between cancerous gene expression and tumor cells um, versus normal, non-cancerous tumor cells to see whether they could obtain a better insight in disease pathology. And the idea was to try to create a generalizable framework for new cancer types and something that could be replicated in, in other population studies as well without having to redesign new features. So the strategy they used, this is the gene expression profile they had. And um, it's, very, it's very high dimensional data. So they wanted to reduce the dimensions of this data. So they used principal component analysis. But the problem with principal component analysis is it's a linear combination of, of everything in that profile. And it's very hard to interpret. So they also used feature engineering, raw features that would be associated with cancer or features that were inferred. And then they, they, try to, they try to identify some latent variable using the autoencoder. So they had their, their training data. And another example that um, latent variable modeling is, is useful is an intensive care use where you have um, the problem of delayed intensive care admission is correlated with mortality. So if you ignore correlations among vital signs, um, you, could miss, you could miss patients who should be admitted to ICU. And you have the reverse problem as well, that you may admit people to ICU when they shouldn't be in ICU. So in this particular study, they looked at um, patterns of signals over time to see whether they could understand who are the patients who should be admitted to ICU and who are the patients who maybe didn't need to go to ICU in a life-threatening position. So this particular study looked at risk auditing methodology to um, try to understand the, the benefits of ICU. 
and avoid septic shocks. In this particular framework, um, the authors used a multitask Gaussian process model for ICU admission. So there were some observed indicators. So they had different phenotypes or things like blood pressure, mm, heart, the heart rate. And this was looked to be associated with static admission information and the clinical status. So they wanted to learn these different associations. And they inferred that there was some, some generative latent class which was associated with, with this profile over time. And there was also a time varying aspect of these symptoms. So you had, um, you had sampling of these physiological symptoms over time. And this also had some classification. And they were able to identify um, a more personalized strategy based on those subtypes, which were, and identify who were those who should go to ICU and who shouldn't. So um, one of the things that I promised to talk about was the principles of causality and how we can set up uh, an experiment to look at causality as well. Um, I thought it's good to focus firstly on the Bradford Hill principles of causality. Sorry, can you hear me better in the back? Okay, perfect. Okay, so the Bradford Hill principles of causality, which are based on epidemiology. So Bradford Hill, these were um, two scientists who established causality between tobacco smoking and lung cancer. And in the 70s, when they came up with it, I think it was the 70s, they there was a lot of arguments around whether lung, whether lung cancer was actually caused by smoking. And um, they created this seven step principle of causality to help us understand when we could infer that a relationship is causal and when it's not. So the six important steps, the first important step is actually temporality. So you expect the risk factor to occur before the outcome. So in this case, you expect smoking to occur before, before lung cancer. Um, the second is plausibility. So that there's some, it, it's clinically plausible. It's reasonable to say that. Consistency, that there's replication. So for example, in genetic studies, that you can replicate um, genetic experiments in different places in diff at different times using different models as well. And I think one good example of consistency is BRAC1, the BRAC1 variant, which um, gives you a 30 to a 50 to 75 percent risk of breast cancer. That's an example of a consistent association that we can see is causal. The fourth principle is strength, so whether the effect size is is big, is significant. Specificity is less important, so that there's one cause for one disease, that that's the only thing that causes it. And um, when you change the risk factor, then you reduce the risk of the disease. So those are the, the principles of causality according to Bradford Hill. And a lot of work has been done in, in mediation and moderation to try to understand when we could say something is causal and when we say something is not causal. So I'm going to explain two concepts. The first concept is a moderator. So a moderator is a variable that changes the impact of one variable on another. So imagine you have some risk factor, it could be a gene, um, and that causes an outcome, let's say cancer. A moderator modifies the effect of the risk factor on the outcome. So a moderator, for example, could be healthy eating. So it's a multiplicative effect, and you can think of it as a regression analysis where the predictor is your risk factor, the outcome is your, is your outcome, your output, and, um, or your dependent variable. And depending on how much of the moderator you have, it modifies the effect of the predictor on the outcome. So that's a multiplicative effect. A mediator, on the other hand, is something that has an, that um, is, is mediated. So it's a mechanism by which one variable affects another variable. So imagine you have the risk factor, your predictor, and you have your outcome, and there's some direct effect between your predictor or your risk factor and the outcome, 
But part of that effect is also indirect. It's mediated as well through, through something else. So a mediator, for example, could be a gene. So if we have a predictor as um, smoking, the outcome is lung cancer. A mediator could be a certain gene that mediates the effect of smoking on lung cancer. So smoking and lung cancer, there's a direct effect, but there could be an indirect effect as well. So depending on your genes, genotype, um, it could affect the outcome, the risk factor of cancer. Um, and when we're trying to... Oh, it's gone too far. Right. So the way we test mediation is in four stages. First, what we do is look at the association between the independent variable, or our risk factor, and our dependent variable, so the disease. The next step would be to look at the association between the independent variable and the mediator, um, and then the mediator and the dependent variable and in the fourth stage, we say that the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable is significantly reduced when we control for the mediator. And a lot of work has been done by, by Goodman on this. Um, he's written a paper in, in the JAMA on this. Another way of testing mediation effects is through instrumental variables. So Nando mentioned in his talk the other day, instrumental variables. So instrumental variables allow us to have consistent, unbiased estimations of those explanatory variables or risk factors, um, especially if the risk factor is correlated with the error term in the regression model. So if the, error, if the risk factor is correlated with the error term, then we're going to find that um, the parameter estimate for that risk factor, how much risk there is for that risk factor, for predicting the, the outcome is going to be biased um, because of that correlation with the error term. So instrumental variables are used to estimate causal relationships when we control the expert, when maybe the randomization process isn't feasible or if treatment isn't successfully delivered, we say that there's some instrumental variable that can explain some of that association. So scenarios where we would want to use an instrumental variable. So one scenario would be reverse causation. So an example of this is um, the hygiene hypothesis that I mentioned earlier. So the hypothesis is that asthma causes, um, causes asthma, sorry, antibiotic use causes asthma because antibiotic use means that you have a clean gut and it makes you more susceptible to illnesses such as asthma. But another, another thing could be actually um, antibiotic use is a marker of, of susceptibility. So it's not because you take antibiotics that it causes asthma, but because you are going to get asthma, you're more susceptible. So it's like a viral response more than anything else. Um, so using instrumental variables helps us to, to adjust for that reverse causation. Another scenario where we'd want to use instrumental variables is where the omitted variables that affect, um, there may be variables that we haven't measured or that we've omitted that affect both the dependent and independent variables and when covariates are, are subject to measurement error as well. And um, this is how we set up a mediation analysis with instrumental variables. So imagine we have some randomized allocation for treatments, let's say, and we think that treatment is going to have an effect on the outcome. So, yeah. Um, and as in the previous point, we saw that we assume that there's some sort of mediator, like some sort of genetic effect, which mediates the effect of random allocation on outcomes. And maybe there are other covariates as well, um, such as gender or smoking status, which can also affect mediator and the outcome. But if the mediator is, is um, correlated with the measurement error, then this estimate would be, would be biased. So what we do is we moderate the instrument effect. And we say that the instrument effect modifies the mediator. And I'll show an example to illustrate this. So the 
instrumental variable has to be strongly predictive of the mediator. That's one thing. And also, uh, the other thing I didn't point out is that there's no direct effect between, there's no effect between the instrumental variable and the outcome. So the only effect between the instrumental variable and the outcome is through the mediator, through that association with the mediator. And um, also, the instrumental variable doesn't share common causes with anything else in the model. And randomization often satisfies the criteria of instrument an instrumental variable. Um, but when there are departures from randomized treatment, then we need an instrumental variable. And I think um, an example which makes this clearer is, so these sorts of models are often used in, in mental health, where people are also taking um, cognitive behavioral therapy as well as a treatment. And in mental health studies, very often there's lack of adherence to, to treatment. So that's a problem with randomization. So you need an inter instrumental variable to take in that into account. So um, an example of a study is the efficacy and mechanism evaluation. So this is a way of trying to disaggregate that causal framework for investigating who medications work for. So whether there's some sort of prognostic factor that affects whether or not a medication works for you. So going back to the same notation, we have some random allocation which predicts cell outcome. And we think this is, a, this is an instrumental variable, so we can test whether that is true. So we have um, this, this interaction, this modification between the instrumental variable or a predictive biomarker, so that could be a gene or some clinical marker of our mediator. And we can test whether, that's a, um, whether it's an indirect effect or whether it's just, a, it's just an interaction effect, whether it's just a modifier. And we also test whether it has a direct effect on the outcome, because if it has a direct effect on the outcome, that means it's not an instrumental variable, and our estimates are probably still going to be unbiased are still going to be biased, sorry. And we may have other covariates, such as some prop, yeah. Ah, sorry. So that's some, some sort of unmeasured confounding. So um, I'm not going to go into unmeasured confounding, but it's something to take into account that, um, so we can assume that there's some instrumental variables, and typically in clinical trials, you try to measure as much information as possible, but there may be some things that are unmeasured. So I think this is a really good area to, to look up. These models are quite complex to set up, um, and what you're assuming is that there's some latent variable, which is an unmeasured confounder, that's gonna have an effect on your mediator and outcome, but we don't know, we don't know what it is. Thanks for your question. Any other questions? Yeah. And we could look at a specific example of, of cancer. So um, we have some treatment for cancer, and the mediator is the tumor size. And a genetic marker may be an instrumental variable to modify the effect of tumor size on the outcome. And, um, but it has no direct effect on the probability of survival. And we can test these different relationships to see whether they actually are instrumental variables or mediators and moderators. And this helps us disaggregate the mechanism for disease and to figure out who different treatments work for as well. Yeah, so... So the solid lines, good question. The solid lines are what we assume. So these are, we assume that the treatment has a direct effect on the outcome and that this is a mediated effect and that this is an instrumental variable. But for it to be an instrumental variable, we have to make sure that it's not associated with the outcome, um, that any association with the outcome is only through the mediated variable. So we, we have to test this to make sure that these two are really independent and um, that it's not, a, it's not another mediator, it's not, it's not another risk factor that's mediated by tumor sites. 
yeah, so we can we can confirm we can get estimates for for those dotted lines. Any other questions on that? Yeah, typically through through regression analysis. Um, so using two stage least squares or mediation, but mediation analysis. Um, yeah, you can get the the least squares estimator. Yeah. It's a mediator, yeah. So because it's an there's an indirect effect, yeah. Right. So what we assume is that this is measured with error, and um, that the parameter estimates for this are correlated with error. So if that happens, then we're going to get biased estimates for the parameter. So we get an inflated estimate. So by using the instrumental variable, we, we reduce that effect size, essentially. Because there's, there's some factor that's going to account for the association between tumor size and that's going to modify the effect between tumor size and outcome. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's only, it only explains some of the variation in tumor size, but doesn't explain anything about the outcome. So that's a, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, anyway, in a couple of weeks ago, this article came out in The Guardian about um, machine learning. Uh, and I think there's still a lot to be done in machine learning for health. Um, especially in the area of ethics, and that the models we create are fair. And this article in The Guardian said there's less attention paid to the more immediate problem of how to prevent programs of implementing artificial intelligence in healthcare from amplifying equalities and, effect, and um, affecting the most vulnerable members of our society. And this is something that we do see, that um, sometimes some of the models may be maybe um, exacerbating inequalities in society as well. So this is a, an area of machine learning and health as well, to try to see how we can create models that are fair and don't disadvantage weaker members of society. And also there are other disease areas where there's a lot of work to be done. So I've talked to quite a few of you about studies you're doing and I think quite a few people are working on TB or HIV and malaria as well. Um, so just some reflections on team science to, to um, finish off. So a lot of these collaborations are based on having a team. And um, machine learning and healthcare, that's a sine qua non, so it's essential. And the key to collaboration in machine learning is effective communication, because you're talking to someone who's talking a different language very often. We're not experts in their subject area. And it's important to create models that reflect the assumptions that that person is trying to make and also it's a challenge trying to extract those assumptions as well. For example, if we're using a Bayesian paradigm, um, we may need to extract priors and think of ways of how to communicate what is a prior and get those estimates from people. Um, assumptions around models that we're trying to build. Also, in machine learning for health, context is really important. So it's really important to think really deeply around the clinical context. I know that I focus a lot on, um, on the clinical application, but really that's fundamental. And not just in clinical applications, but in everything, in any application as well. Because we're trying to find solutions to a specific problem, and we need to contextualize that. And good science is about um, getting a bigger picture from different perspectives, different angles, um, using both a data-driven approach and domain knowledge, which gives us a more holistic approach to, to doing science. And the third lesson, I think, is the importance of um, having principles epidemiological approaches, so especially in areas where we're trying to infer causality in machine, in machine learning for healthcare. 
biostatistics and machine learning. So a heuristic blend of these tools um, is much richer than any one of these tools can give us about understanding causality and clinical relevance. So just to end, um, this is why team science is important, that discoveries about healthcare aren't necessarily priori hypothesized a priori, but sometimes we can use the data to discover things like endotypes or structure in that data. And these, these, this sort of structure can be tuned by, by experts. So this is a dialogue that's ongoing all the time. And um, as I said before, biostatistics is important and good epidemiology and good machine learning models as well that incorporate the assumptions that we're trying to, trying to model. And this reveals more than either discipline can individually. And um, a machine learning approach to extracting knowledge from information in healthcare requires persistent information in integration of data methods and expertise. And that's it for me. So are there any questions? So I guess that's my approach, yeah. Um, yeah, and I guess, I guess the answer is problem specific. So what is the, what is the problem that we're trying to model? Um, what is we're looking at? So in the specific theme of endotype discovery that I've been talking about and trying to identify what are these subtypes or subgroups of disease, um, that is precisely the strategy. So first using a model-based approach. I mean, so I did say at the beginning that you know, a lot of these models don't use deep learning precisely because deep learning is very data hungry. So it works very well for things like imaging data. There's a lot of success. But in that case as well, we can, see, we can identify subtypes using deep learning, but then um, have a separate, something separate where we're inferring causality. The other approach is to just have a unified framework where we look at both um, at both inferring structure and causality. So I tend not to work on that structure. Um, I prefer to do the two independently because it's a sanity check as well. Wow, okay, cool. And what does, okay, cool. <laughs> and, um, okay, okay. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, so it's like a joint modeling framework between deep, with, okay, okay, perfect, great. Yeah, um, I think modeling assumptions is a big one because we don't know all of the assumptions. So it's, it's two ways. One is that we don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I th so I think, um, I think communication, better communication, better modeling assumptions. Um, but sometimes it's very challenging to actually model assumptions or to know what assumptions to model as well. So one way to combat that is by constant communication with clinicians or, well, in the healthcare space with clinicians or whoever you're working with. Because it's very easy to run away with solving problems by simplifying, making simplifying assumptions which maybe aren't plausible. So I think that's... Yeah. 
Yeah, probably, probably. But there are lots of data, she data shields at the moment that that's not possible. Um, although there is work in trying to trying to get ethical approval to combine more data sets as well. But yeah, it, if only. I don't think there's a test available. For, there's not a test available for this, but um, it it is a marker that can be used. So this particular piece of research, it's not been it's not been taken up as yet. But there are other areas where markers have been developed, and people have gone into the clinic. So the typical thing is an allergy. Um, you there are some markers for severity of allergy that you can go into the clinic and use. And those are based on these sorts of model-based approaches. Yeah, so um, those, were, those were data points. They were data points within the same individual. So each individual was followed over time. And there were two different geographical locations. So one was from the north of England, one was from the south of England. one here. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so I combined, I combined the, the two regions. I did them separately as well, but I combined the two. Yeah. And they were more or less the same when you did them independently as well. Yeah, so it could be for various reasons. One, I think the top reason is um, where data is collected from. So sometimes the data collection process is biased at the beginning. So imagine you're creating a model to predict, um, to predict health outcomes, like, I don't know, health outcomes in general. Uh, depending on the type of people, so sometimes Mm, sampling can be biased, so depending on the type of people who enter that study, you're going to create models that are biased towards that subgroup of people. And if you implement that on a wider scale, then it could have severe, severe implications. I think one of, the, one of the areas that I think this is most concerned is in healthcare insurance, for example, especially in places like the United States where um, your health is reliant on whether you could get insurance or not. Um, so imagine if an insurance company got data which was biased against a group because they had lower income or because they had a history of diabetes in their family or whatever, um, then those models could be, could be biased and harmful. I don't know the answers yet, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's, it's something important to take into account and to work towards.
Go ahead, go ahead. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, so I have tested some of these models in, in Australia because they have similar data. But, um, and actually I have a collaboration in South Africa as well. Uh, but I don't know how well it generalizes in South Africa as yet, but in other parts of the world, yes, it does generalize. The part that's not so generalizable is in terms of the genetic components. That's a bit more heterogeneous, actually. Uh, although we did look at studies um, across Europe for that, we didn't look at other continents for, because of data availability. Ah. <laughs> um, so. Really difficult question. Um, so, yeah, I think um, in my particular case, it's just been the collaborators who have been available and also the data that has been available. Um, I guess in the UK, that's quite biased, what data and what collaborators are available and who collects data. So there are certain disease areas where there's a lot of data. For example, cancer, because, oh no. <laughs> oh, anyway. <laughs> Um, so can, there's, there's a lot of research in cancer because it affects one in three people in the UK. So obviously there's a, there's a big research try for that. Um, I mean, ideally you want to work in disease areas that you care about. Um, and yeah, but sometimes it's just what data is available and where you can make a difference in, in the healthcare space as well. Yeah, um, so that's, that's quite, yeah, that's quite difficult as well. So in the UK, um, there are two main funding bodies, which is the Medical Research Council and Wellcome Trust, which funds medical research. There are other more philanthropic agents as well, but um, those are the mo two main bodies of research. And they tend to have these five-year strategies. And the strategies are very focused towards um, Diseases where they think they could have impact quickly because they have the data available within, within the community. But recently, actually, there's been a lot more incentive towards collaborating with, with other countries as well in disease areas that aren't maybe avail in the UK. So, for example, um, one, one example is malaria. But that is very an example that's very few and far between. There's a lot of work in infectious disease as well but um, most of those infectious diseases are within the UK, but there's some work on tuberculosis as well. Um, but it's harder to get funding for these disease areas because they don't have as much impact, which is unfortunate, actually. It's really unfortunate, but that's the way the grant system works, unfortunately. It's quite scary. That's it.